Who is Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, also known as Rashbi? Everyone has heard his name in a Jewish world and even in a non-Jewish world. We just celebrated his Hilula by lighting a fire and learning some Torah and enjoying some food with a great group of people. But the question that we tried to answer is a question that many people perhaps never even asked. Why do we light the fire? Why is Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai so special and so unique that he gets the rest of Klal Israel to celebrate his Ilula until this day, while his Rabbi, Rabbi Akiva, and even Moshe Rabbeinu don't? What's so special about Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai? What's so unique about him? What can we learn from him? What can we learn about him that could affect our lives today? This and much more was discussed tonight in a beautiful night with beautiful people in the most extraordinary Torah of all. Enjoy it, share it, and be holy. Glad to have everybody here and uh, doing this Lag uh, Ba'omer at the house, Baruch Hashem. We had a, a good turnout last year, Baruch Hashem as well this year. So of course, the uh, whole day, the reason why we're even all here on a Monday uh, is uh, because of Abishim Ba Yochai. But the, uh, oh, it's just before I forget, the uh, Shiu. It's not only for the honor of uh, the Lula of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, but also it's going to be for the Refua Shlema, for Rabbanit Sarah Bat Anat, Rabbi Ephraim Ben Shulamit, Rabbanit uh, Levana Bat Sarah, Avi Mori David Ben Esriya, Imi Morati Doris Bat Jora, and Atzlacha Rabba and Refua Shlema to all of Am Yisrael, all the righteous Noahides, all the righteous people that continue to watch our Shurim, continue to help us spread the Torah around the world. So, while we were about Bo Hashem enjoying the fire, I asked everybody a question. It's a very common question and has many answers. Uh, why do we even light the fire? In fact, one of the biggest things that uh, remains a puzzle in, uh, in, in many people's perspective is, if Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is the Talmud of Rabbi Akiva, how come we don't do any Lula for Rabbi Akiva? Rabbi Akiva is the rabbi. And if Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, as the Ramchal says, and many other Chachamim as well, but he was the main one that uh, brought this uh, Chidush in his Sefer, Abir Ma, uh, Bamaron. He says that uh, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai was the, his Neshama at the Nitzots of Moshe Rabbeinu. So if we're celebrating the Ilul of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, we should be celebrating the Ilula of Moshe Rabbeinu. We don't have a fire for Moshe Rabbeinu. So obviously it's not less kavod or less uh, uh, extraordinary uh, uh, kedusha for Moshe Rabbeinu or Rabbi Akiva, but the question is, why did Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai get such kavod that until this day, whether you are religious or you are secular, Everybody celebrates Lag Baumel. They have a fire, they go to a fire, they have a uh, barbecue. You know, the Khatam Sofer, Allah Shalom, said that, uh, you know, in, uh, in, for many, many years, the uh, gravesite of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai in Meron was a place that everybody would go to to this day, Baruch Hashem. Fortunately, we had a big tragedy a few years ago, but. It was uh, a lot of celebration at that uh, over the years, but unfortunately for a period of time, there was a lot of pritzut at the gravesite on uh, Lag Baumil. People would go there and, you know, boys and girls dance or uh, they'd uh, slaughter animals, not in a kosher way. So the Khatam Sofer said that Rabbi Shimon Yochai is at the gravesite all year round, except on Lag Baumil. Because of so many sins that were happening over there. Baruch Hashem today, there's a lot of Kedusha over there. They've separated things. They've sanctified things. But many people don't really know the reason behind a lot of the things that we do in Judaism. And that's why when a missionary 
whether a missionary from, athe- from uh, atheism or from Christianity comes and asks the typical Jew questions, the average Jew doesn't really know the answers. And really one of the most lethal weapons of the Satan is ignorance. When a person doesn't know, he doesn't realize how much danger he's in. Needless to say, his children or her children. So it's important for us to know all the small things and the big things. So the first question we have is why do we have a fire? Why do we have a fire? As a couple of you said, the Torah of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai was unique. When he came out of that cave, as the Gemara in Masechet Shabbat, in uh, page 33b, says that uh, after a, a foolish person who happened to be a girl, apparently not a Ger Tzedek, decided to go and disclose the conversation of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and the Chachamim about the Romans, to the Romans. And they, of course, put a warrant out for the uh, arrest of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. They wanted to kill him, so he had to flee, he had to run away, and he took his Chavruta. Who is his Chavruta? His son. Why did he choose his son, his little son, to take him? He says in multiple places... In the Gemara, how his merits and his son's merits are enough for the whole world. Meaning that he didn't find anybody else that he could study with, that he could rely on, that he could take with on this journey. He took his son. Another reason why he took his son is because Nashim Da'atam Kala, his wife, after all she's a woman, and she could be convinced with threats much more than a man can, they're much more emotional if they threaten her that if she doesn't tell them where the uh, her husband is, they'll kill her son. Almost every woman will give in. As much as she loves her husband, she loves her kids even more sometimes. It's a reality that you have to deal with. So, Rabbi Shimon knew you had to take his son. He goes into the cave, he studies for 12 years. Chachamim teaches that the amount of Torah that was in that cave was out of this world. All of the Avot came. Avraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov came to the cave. Learned Torah with Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Eliyahu Navi came to the cave. Learned Torah with Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Moshe Rabbeinu came to the cave. Learned Torah with Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Malachim came to the cave. Learned Torah with Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Unbelievable Torah. He came out of the cave, him and his son. The Gemara says they in Masechet Shabbat, they saw the world, they saw people dealing with basic stuff, not violating Shabbat, killing people, or anything like that, but they simply saw people just, you know, working. They said, how could you work? How do you deal with this world? And not go learn Torah. And the Kedusha that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai had was simply too much for this world to handle. When he would look at somebody, the, uh, the person would go on fire. The house would go on fire, build them would go on fire. His son would look at somebody, go on fire. A bat call came out from Shemaim, said, what are you came to, destroy my world? Go back into the cave. And they went back into the cave for another year, to calm down a little bit. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and his son came out again. He was, he was okay, he was able to handle things, understand that every, not everybody's Rabbi Shimon. His son... Need a little bit more time. So every time his son looked at somebody, went on fire, Rabbi Shimon would turn it off. That's what the Quran says. Mama Shabbat. So now, what's, why, why did they get, how did they get this? How do I get this fire? I have a few people I can look at and maybe put them on fire. Some people I mentioned in the lecture yesterday, some people are on the Jewish warning list. You know, I have a few people I can put on fire. Nobody can even say it's me because, you know, I'm looking at them. It's great. No, but seriously, how does somebody get such a Kedusha? Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai was given a gift from HaKadosh Baruch Hu of the Torah Tassod, the secret parts of the Torah. And immediately when people hear secrets of the Torah, they immediately look for things to fly, you know, somebody to look at you, put you on fire, make you fly in the air. But the secret parts of the Torah is much more than just the different uh, supernatural things. The, super, the, the uh, secret parts of the Torah is to understand the deeper meaning of every single thing that we have in Judaism 
whether it be the mitzvot or the way we serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu, or the way that we fix ourselves or fix our marriages or the Kedusha between a man and his wife is endless amount of secrets in the Torah, much more than the average person can even comprehend. But the point is that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai was given this gift. And he was given this gift because he was willing to sacrifice his life much more than anybody else in his generation was willing to do. Now, to answer the first question of why do we have a fire, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai knew that he has to get out of this cave at some point. He cannot keep this Torah to himself. The Gemara in Masechet Chagiga says that if a person learns Torah and doesn't share it, he is like a person who doesn't have a God. Because the, one of the purposes of a Torah is for you to learn the traits of Hashem, the midot of Hashem. Hashem, does He take anything from you? Do you give Hashem anything? Only the heretics think that you give Hashem something. Hashem takes nothing from us. He only gives. There's nothing for Him to take from us. The mitzvot are for us. It's us serving Hashem. Us perfecting ourselves, Us purifying ourselves. The Torah is in order to know who Hashem is, what Hashem is, how to do His mitzvot. That's for us again. Everything is for us. Our servitude of Hashem is for our benefit, not His. Only the heretics think that you serve Hashem because He needs you to serve Him. So, when HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai these secrets of the hidden part of the Torah, he wanted Rabbi Shimon to spread this Torah. And a person that learns Torah and does not share it is a person that does not know that the minimum of minimum to know about Hashem is that He always gives. So if He always gives, at the very least, you should give what He gave you. He gave you Torah. Share it with other people. So Rabbi Shimon Bar knew you had to leave the cave in order to do Zikwe Rabim, in order to help people do Tshuva, get closer to Hashem. But... He knew that if it was just going to be speaking to people, it's not going to be enough. Why? At some point, he's going to die. So he wrote down the Zohar. He started writing the Zohar. And Chachamim teach us that he was almost finished with the Zohar. But he was given the knowledge that it's time to leave. It's time to go. At the end of today, you have to get out. So Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai commanded the sun to stay in the sky. Stay in the sky until I finish. The Gemara says there's only a hand, four people that are Kadosh Baruch Hu, let, the, let the sun stay in the sky for them. One of them is Yeshua Ben Nun. Another one is Nagdimon ben Gurion. Great people, Akadosh Baruch left, left the sun in the sky for them. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai commanded the sun to stay in the sky. Why? I can't let the day be over because once it's over, I have to get out. But I'm not finished. So stay in the sky until I finish this last chidush in the Zohar. Then you can go down. So he let the world benefit from extra light we benefit from the we benefit from that light we, that light of the Torah and that's why we also light the medulla we light the, uh, the fire he let the fire continue we let the fire continue so that's another reason of why we have the fire but to understand really why Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai was so special and unique that he was the one that was gifted this gift I mean certainly Rabbi Akiva had endless amount of knowledge and Kedusha. As the Gemara says that he one time saw a person running while he was carrying huge amount of wood, enough for 10 people. But he was running as if he was being chased by an army. To Rabbi Akiva, this was, you know, he saw him. He didn't think anything of it, he just stopped the guy. The guy wouldn't stop, he commanded him to stop. He asked him, who are you? If you are somebody's slave, I'll buy you. I'll buy you from your owner. You don't have to work this hard. 
If you're poor, I'll give you money, I'm rich. Rabbi Akiva became wealthy in multiple different places. One of them was that his father-in-law, after he realized who Rabbi Akiva was, gave him half of his money. Kalba Savua was his name. Another one was what his second wife was the, uh, the, her- the, uh, the ex-wife of the Roman Caesar who converted. She converted to Judaism. She's very wealthy. Rabbi Akiva became very, very rich. So he told the guy, listen, if it's money that you're chasing, I'll get you the money. You don't have to work this hard. What are you doing? The guy says to him, no, 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 for the Rav. I'm not from this world. I don't even know how you can see me. I'm in Kafakela. And I have to run from all these mazikim, these, uh, these uh, destructive angels. Because if I don't work this hard, they'll beat me up even more. Shemishmo. So obviously Rabbi Akiva was Kodesh Kodeshim. So the question we have to go back to again is why did Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai get this? To know this answer we really need to know a little bit more about what Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, what he taught, who he was. As we said, the Ramchal says in Sefer Abir Babarom that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai was the Nitzotz, the spark of Moshe Rabbeinu. Now today, anybody that can speak a little bit, maybe even write a few books, everybody says, oh yeah, this is the next Rav Ovadia. this is the Mashiach, this is the next, uh, I don't know, Gdol Ador. You know, everybody is uh, all of a sudden, is Kadosh and Ta'ol. People have no concept of what Kadosh and Ta'ol is, but they say, no, this guy, yeah, he's good on YouTube. This guy, yeah, he has a uh, thousand people showed up to his uh, lecture. He must be the Mashiach. People are delusion. Delusional. Rav Meir Eliyahu Shichyeh said something very funny. Real life story, but Mamash, you see, that when you're from my side of, the, of, the, of, the, uh, of, the, of, of where things are, it drives you crazy. But I, I understand that, unfortunately, when people don't know, they don't know what they don't know. So he says... One of the things that drives them crazy is how delusional sometimes people are. How they make everybody into something that's much more than what they really are. And people that are really chachamim, really tzadikim, they mistreat them. Ah, what's the big deal? As the Gemara in Maseret Makot says that, you know, people stand up for the Torah. Woe to the people who don't stand up for Talmit Chacham, who is a living Sefer Torah. So, he says... One time he was invited to go give a lecture and there was another guy that was speaking before him that supposedly was a Mekubal. Mekubal. He says, I don't know if he was a Mekubal or not. All I know is I was sitting over there, he was supposed to go first and then I was supposed to go after him. But he told me, listen, my stomach, Kvod Arav, is not feeling good. So do me a favor, they're going to call me, you go speak first. I'll be back. Fine, no problem. So they call the guy to come and speak. Missing in action. Nobody knows where he is. So they see Rameh Eliyahu there. They say, oh, Rav, so you, you go then. So he speaks for a little while and then the guy comes back. And then they bring the guy and he speaks. So as Rameh Eliyahu comes down, a few of the hosts of the people over there that know this rabbi, this Mekubal, say, ah, you see our rabbi? He's such a he's so mystical, he's so magical. He just disappears. You ever see? He always disappears. We don't know where he is. He just disappears all the time. It's amazing, right? I mean, yeah, I was like, what, what, what's amazing? The guy went to the bathroom. What, what, what amazing? What amazing? What disappears? But everybody wants to make you know everybody into something magical, mystical. Or another another person told me the other day. Oh, you know this this rabbi such and such. Yeah, yeah. They uh, you know he already knew the entire shas by heart. At 13 years old. Funny thing is, most people don't even know how, what, how, to, finish this, how to finish one duff in the Masechet Shabbat. How to finish one duff in any Masechet. But I said, no, no. This rabbi knew the whole Shas by heart. Already at age 13. How do you know? Why? Because they said it in the video? Did the rabbi ever say such a thing? No. The rabbi never said two words to say such a thing. Even somebody that would finish the Shas... A thousand times would never tell you finish the shas a thousand times. Needless to say, tell you knows it by heart. Kabbalah Masech Bav Metziah tells you that if you know, and somebody asks you if you know, 
It's better for you to say you don't know. Why? It's humility. But everybody likes to say, no, no, this rabbi, yeah, he already knew everything. He already knew everything when he was two. He was already born with uh, Moshe Rabbeinu's right hand. All types of nonsense that people make up. Or better yet, when you ask him, oh, your rabbi said such and such, but uh, where's the source for it? Oh, no, no. I asked him, but he, he says there's no source needed. It's a, it's a known thing. He said, everything needs a source. That's how our Torah works. Everything needs a source. But unfortunately today, people don't know what they don't know. So the Ramchal didn't just say that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is the Nitzot of Moshe Rabbeinu. The Ramchal brings a verse. In Tehilim, chapter 68, verse 19. It says, Alita la marom, shivita shevi, lakachta matanot ba'adam, ve'af sorim l'shachen yal elokim. Says you, which is referring to Moshe Rabbeinu, you ascended to the heights. This is talking about Moshe Rabbeinu going to Mount Sinai, the Gemara Masechet Shabbat. It, uh, I believe it's page 87, 88. And Masechet Shabbat talks about how, or 89. Uh, Masechet Shabbat says that Moshe Rabbeinu went up to Shemaim at Mount Sinai, and the Malachim were arguing with him. You are a son of a woman. What's to you in the Torah? Moshe Rabbeinu was scared of them. Hashem said to Moshe Rabbeinu, answer them. Moshe said, yeah, but they're going to burn me. They're all fire. Hashem says to Moshe, hold on to my throne and answer them. I'll protect you. So Moshe Rabbeinu, now he knows Hashem got his back. He says, obviously the Torah is for us. Do you keep Shabbat, Malachim? No. Do you eat kosher, Malachim? No. Do you have an uh, obligation to get married? No. Kids? No. Obviously, the mitzvot of the people. So, the Torah is for us. The Malachim liked his answer so much, each one of them came to Moshe Rabbeinu, gave him a present. Gave him a gift. Including the Malachim of it. Gave him a present. So, it says that you, Moshe Rabbeinu, you ascended to the heights, says David the Melech. You captured the spoil. What's the spoil? The spoil is the Torah. Taking gifts. Who is he taking gifts from? From these Malachim, from these celestial beings. Taking gifts for man, even in the midst of those who have been rebellious once, to dwell with Hashem. So David Amelach says, You, Moshe Rabbeinu, went up to Shemaim, you got the Torah for us, you even got gifts from these angels. Why? So we could all get closer to Hashem, even if we're Shaim. Even the wicked people can get closer to Hashem because of you. So the Ramchal says, Alita Lamarom, Shivita Shevi, that you got spoil, Shevi, Shevi is the Rashet uh, Tevot, the acronym for Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Meaning that one of the gifts that you got is the Neshama of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Moshe Rabbeinu brought that down with him to this world. Also, the the word uh, um, Shevi is also the acronym for the Yitzchak ben Shlomo. Who's Yitzchak ben Shlomo? The Arizal. The Arizal is the one that uncovered the secrets in the Torah of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. It was available for many, many years, but people didn't understand it until the Arizal unfolded all the secrets. And then after him, you have Shevi also is the acronym for Shalom Ben Yitzchak. Who's Shalom Ben Yitzchak? Rabbi Shalom Ben Yitzchak is the Rashash. The Rashaz was one of the great Mekubalim, lived after the Arizal and unfolded many of the secrets of the Arizal into the world. This triangle of Neshamot, the Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, the Arizal, the Rashash, they're known as the triangle of Neshamot that uncovered the mystical part of the Torah, the hidden part of the Torah into the world. 
Now, they're the ones that brought the Kabbalah, they're the ones that uncovered everything, but it all started with Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. It's all based on the gift that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai brought to the world. Now, the Gemara in Masechet Shabbat, page 138b, says a statement that in the future, the Torah will be forgotten. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai responds to this statement and he says, Chas v'shalom. Heaven forbid that the Torah will be, forget, will be forgotten because it will be contrary to the Torah. As the verse in chapter uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 31 verse 21, Sefer Dvarim, Perek Lamed Aleph, Pasuk Chaf Aleph, says, Kilot Ishkach mi Pizaro. Says that uh, for it will not be forgotten from the mouth of the of the seed. Meaning, this is a promise from Hakadosh Baruch Hu that Am Israel will never forget the Torah completely. Now, this is a statement that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai brought. The first time you look at the statement, the second time you look at the statement, the fifth time you look at the statement, the tenth time you look at the statement, all you can see. Okay, so I get it, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Reminded us of what HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, which is that Am Yisrael is not going to ever forget the Torah. But to show you a small, tiny microcosm of the genius of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, is that he doesn't just use this verse, because this is verse said what he wanted it to say, because there are other verses he can use. But rather because this verse has the Sofet Tevot of his name as well. Kilo Tishkach now, having a pasuk that has your name, Yochai, in it, also have the answer shows that, again, there's hidden treasures in every single word in the Torah, but when a Chacham is able to unfold it, he shows you how much more there is for us to learn. Now, what did he really mean by this though? Why do I need to know that the ending letter, the Sofet Tevot of each word in that verse, spells out the name of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai? Why do I need to know this? Why is it, how is this going to help me? What's the secret here? The secret behind the secret. What Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is trying to teach us is that by unveiling the Torah and its secrets, he is assuring that a Kadosh Baruch Hu's word is stamped into stone. Meaning, a Kadosh Baruch Hu promised the Torah is never going to be forgotten. So, how is bringing the secrets of the Torah going to assure that the Torah is not going to be forgotten? Because, in order for us to know the Torah, that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai brought to the world, the mystical part of the Torah, the supernatural, the, sick, the secret, the hidden, we have to delve into it much, much more than we ever did before. And therefore, a person that delves into the Torah and its secrets becomes more committed to the Torah. And that Torah becomes more committed to him in both his physical and spiritual memory. As the Tosfot says in Masechet Ketubot, page 104, in the name of Eliyahu Navi, that if a person wants to learn Torah, they can't just come to Shiur once in a while, watch online once in a while, or even every day they watch Shiurim and think that they're going to become Talmit Chacham that way. You may know, perhaps, not to kill people, you may know perhaps a few things that's going to make your marriage better. You may know which parasha it is of the week. You may even know a few good stories to tell on Shulchan Shabbat. But to acquire Torah and to be a Talmud Chacham, where somebody asks you a question and you not only know the answer, but you know the source of the answer, you know where to find the answer, even if you don't know the answer, you know where to find the answer, which part of the Shulchan Aruch, 
which part of the Gemara, which Chachamim talked about it, which generation it's relevant to. That's not going to come from watching Shuret Torah or reading superficially a few books. It's not going to come that way. If a person wants to acquire Torah, it's a lot more than just reading books. It's a lot more than just watching Shurim. And Liyahu Navi says that until a person prays that he has the secrets of the Torah enter his stomach, his innards, he should pray the delicious food doesn't enter his stomach instead. What is Eliyahu Navi trying to tell us? Why is he rebuking us right now? We didn't even start yet. Eliyahu Navi says, unfortunately many times people, they want to have a cake and eat it too. They want to learn Torah, but they want to do it at the comfort of whenever it's convenient, whenever they have a lot of energy, whenever they have a lot of time and nothing to do with it, whenever it's easy to learn, and easy to understand, whenever it's not too long, so it doesn't take up too much of my day, whenever it tastes good, and I like it, not only I like the stories, and I like it, but you know, it's not too complicated. Eliyahu Navi says, you want to complete the Shas in one day, but you also want to sleep too. It won't work. If you want to acquire Torah, it's going to require a lot more than simply reading a few books and watching a few shulim. Or reading a lot of books and watching many shulim. Still not enough. The Khatam Sofer was a gifted child. And his parents gave him over to one of the giants of the generation, Rabbi Natan Adler. Rabbi Natan Adler was one of the special neshamot that the Rebbe Mitzan says was certainly one of the 36 neshamot. And Chachamim from his own generation said, it's been many generations since a special neshama like Rabbi Natan Adler came to the world. The Khatam Sofer as a little kid was already his Talmud. Once the Khatam Sofer became great, one of the Gdole Ado, one of the giants of all giants, where one time there was a woman that did not want to listen to the rabbi. He said, no wigs. Even though he's Ashkenazi, no wigs. She put a wig on. He says, oh, you go against the Chachamim? You found out she went against the Chachamim? She died that week. She died that week. When they told the Khatam Sofer that she died, he said, make sure when you bring her body, before you bury it, pass by my house. They brought the body, passed by his house, knocked on the door, brought the rabbi, rabbi opened, unfolded the face, spit in her face, and covered it back. He says, what did you get? For going against the Chachamim and breaking the fence. So the Chatam Sofer became a giant among giants. But he wasn't a giant always. He was a little kid learning Torah. And he continued learning Torah with Rabbi Natan Adler. And the Klosenberger Rebbe, the Rebbe Mitzan, says, It's no wonder that the Khatam Sofer became such a great tzaddik and chacham and gaon and tzaddik. And it's no wonder. It's not wonder. Why is no wonder? Once you hear how the Khatam Sofer describes how he served his rabbi, clearly you can see why he became such a tzaddik and such a chacham, such a gadol. How did he, how did he serve his rabbi? Arav Ovadia in Sefer Anaf Etz Avot says the Khatam Sofer would tell his students that his greatest time in his life was when he would serve his rabbi, Rabbi Natan Adler. He said, how do you serve him, Kodarav? He said, I served him exactly like a slave 
serves his master. Give us an example. He says, one time, we had to travel somewhere early in the morning and the ground was snowy and it was a storm. Not an easy time to travel, especially horse and carriage. But of course we had to go and we had to be in a hurry because before it gets too difficult. So we had to wash our hands on the way. So we stopped the carriage. But unfortunately, there's no water. So I went outside, took some snow in my hands and warmed the snow up. Handful after handful until I filled up entire pot of water so my rabbi can do until I die. And my hands were very, very cold and freezing, but I was so happy to be, have the opportunity to bring this water to my rav and wash his hands. You go ask a person, listen, uh, your rabbi needs a ride to, uh, to the doctor. He needs a ride to the airport. Okay, I'll call him an Uber. I'll call him an Uber. Ask if he's a good guy. Ask if he's a good guy. Yes, the average person, listen, uh, your uh, rabbi needs, uh, needs you to help him with a few things. No, he probably has somebody else. I'm busy. I'll donate more on Yom Kippur. The average person doesn't understand what that means. Chachamim teach us that in order to get to have the merit, have the merit of having Torah, Hashem has to decide to give it to you. To do that requires a lot more than just simply reading some books that you like and watching some lectures that you like. The Gemara in Masechet Brachot has nine memot, nine places where Rabbi Yochanan, the giant Amora, teach in the name of Rabbi Shimon Ba Yochai. Rabbi Shimon Ba Yochai is mentioned many, many times in the Talmud, more than a couple hundred times, almost 200 times you can find them, just with the full name Rabbi Shimon Ba Yochai. But sometimes it says Rabbi Shimon. If you count out two, and every time it says Rabbi Shimon, it's also Rabbi Shimon Ba Yochai. Count out two, it's one of a few hundred times. So to know a little bit about Rabbi Shimon Ba Yochai, we have to see what does he teach? What does he teach? The Gemara Masechah Brachot, page 7b, says, Rabbi Yochanan said in the name of Rabbi Shimon Ba Yochai, a degenerate child in a person's home is a severe affliction. It's painful. Much more than the future war of Gog and Magog. Based on the verse that we learned from David Melech in uh, Psalm chapter 3, verse 1, a song of David as he fled from Avshalom his son. And immediately after that it's written, David says that to his degenerate son, Avshalom, or about his uh, son of, of Shalom to Hashem, Hashem, how many are my tormentors? Many rise up against me. However, when it comes to the war of Gog and Magog, it says, why do people gather and the nations talk in vain? So, here Rabbi Shimon Ba Yochai, we spoke a little bit more deeper about this specific uh, Ma'amal in uh, a few months ago. But here Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says, first and foremost, know this, having Torah in your house is not just something that you do for yourself so you can go to heaven. 
having Torah in your house is in order for you to avoid Genom. But not Genom that we made a whole movie about. Genom here. What Genom here? Genom here is a life without Torah. For sure, your sons are going to be degenerates. Without Torah, absolutely, 100% certainty, your children will be degenerates. Why? What else are they going to learn? They go learn, they go to a school today, if it's a public school, Hashem Ishmo, already at the time of the Me'am Loez, he already wrote back then, that public schools back then, 300 years ago, is Abu Dazara. What would he say about today's public schools where they teach kids that nobody can decide your gender for you? You can decide to be an it. You can decide that you are black even if you are whiter than uh, my shirt. You can decide that you are a cat. You can decide that you are a pizza and somebody just ate you. There's one guy that decided... That he is a baby, even though he is 40 years old, weighs no less than 250, 300 pounds, as ugly as our sins, but he walks around with a diaper and a little tank top like a baby and a binky, little, little, and he cries on the floor. That's him. And his wife actually has this on an interview. She says, yeah, that's who he really is. He's a baby. Like, this is what they teach in school today. You can be anything, including something that defies science, something that defies logic, something that defies nature, defies everything that we know to be true. Now, if you say, oh, yeah, but okay, so I'll send my kids to a religious school. They'll go to yeshiva. Which yeshiva are they going to go to? Are they going to go to a yeshiva where they call themselves a yeshiva but the boys and girls sit next to each other? Or they go to the yeshiva where the kids are given so much freedom that they have enough time to smoke and sell marijuana in the schoolyard? Or it's the yeshiva where the rabbi himself is not really so sure why anybody is even here. He just wants to make a living. Now, this is not the yeshiva's fault. This is the parents' fault. Now, certainly there are many good yeshivot. But the world is big. If a parent doesn't do enough sacrifice for the Torah, who's to say he's going to pick the one that's a diamond in the rough? And even if you send the kids to the right yeshiva, if the kid comes back home, and sees that his parents are more interested in money, in sports, in this world, in materialism, why should he be any different? Somebody said recently, of course, you could learn Torah, but, you know, what are you really going to do with it? What are you going to be... Uh, a gadol? What are you going to be? A shas yid? Meaning somebody that knows the shas? Ah, no. I couldn't believe my ears. Yes, that's the point. Yes, yes. That's what you're supposed to do. Yeah, go learn. Maybe you're not going to be a gadol, but at the very least, be a shas yid. Be somebody that knows some Torah. But for some reason or another, there's a certain segment of our own people that have simply given up on this generation. They intentionally want to keep people stupid, spiritually stupid. Do you know how many young kids I meet that have gone to yeshiva, have gone through the system their whole life, they have never been in a secular house in their life, they didn't have the childhood that I had, they didn't have to work when they were 10, 11 years old just to make ends meet for it to help their parents, they didn't have to work three jobs while they were in high school, they didn't have to do any of that stuff. They went to yeshiva. Parents paid $1,000 or more a month in, in tuition. Some of them even advanced and went to 
call out for a few years before they found themselves. You meet these guys. What are you learning? Oh no, I'm not. Re- you know, once in a while I go to the shoot. Wait, wait, hold on a sec. What do you mean, once in a while? You went to yeshiva your whole life. How do you not learn? Continue. Because now I'm busy with some stuff. I got work now. I say, okay, but why are you? You're not learning anymore. You went to school for twenty years. That's it. All the learning stays in school, or better yet. What are you learning? Yeah, we're learning a little bit of Baba Metzia, a little bit of uh, Baba Batra, a little bit of Masechet Avot. I said, whoa, hold on a second. You're either the biggest genius of the generation or you have no idea what you're talking about. Why? Who learns three Masechet at a time? Baba Masechet Shabbat, somebody came to Rabbi Akadosh, asked him a question. One of the Talmudim rebuked him. He says, how are you asking Rabbi Akadosh, Rabbi Udanasi, that wrote the Mishnah, how are you asking him a question if you know he's learning a different Masechet right now? You're asking about a different Masechet. From there, Chachamim say, who's learning multiple Masechets? Why? Unless you are able to mamash, chew them up and really understand multiple Masechet, one Masechet at a time. But today it's standard. It's standard in Yeshivot. Especially the Baalet Shuvat Yeshivot or the Yeshivot that, in so many words, are run in the same way as this system that wants to stupefy the generation where they simply skip Throughout the Masechet, no one ever finishes anything. Oh, we'll start off on uh, Masechet Met- Baba Metzia. Okay, uh, the guy starts reading. Oh, no, 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 we're not starting from the beginning. Why not? Why, well, Mrs. Shior? No, no, we're going to start on uh, uh, Dav Tetvav, Amud Aleph. Well, that's 15 pages. What happened to the first 15 pages? No, no, that's where we're going to start. The next day... Okay, just uh, we're going to start at uh, Daf Lamed. Wait, we, we didn't do thir- 15 pages yesterday. Why are we going to page 30? No, we're going to study a little bit over there. And they just skip around everywhere. Nobody knows anything. You ask the kids, what do you know? What did you learn? They don't know anything. They don't know anything. So, the truth is, this is not the yeshiva's fault. Alone. It's the parents' fault. Why? Because if the father was a shasid, the kid would have something to look up to at least. When he comes home from school, he sees his father learning. He says, okay, you know what? That's what we do in his family. We learn. He's not looking for the next basketball tournament. He's not looking for some piano lessons. He's not looking to become a, uh, a, a stamp collector. He knows to be a Jew, you have to learn. So, the reality here we see that Rabbi, Rabbi Yochanan is teaching in the name of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Everyone is scared of having a bad child. Because a bad child is even worse than the damage that's going to happen from the war of Gog Magog. But at the same time, people don't understand that they're creating a bad child by not having... The Torah of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, the Torah of Rabbi Yochanan, the Torah of Rabbi Akiva, the Torah of Moshe Rabbeinu, in their house, standard from beginning to end. You want to work, work, but where's the Torah? You want to make money, make money, but when's the Torah? Make a billion dollars, I don't care. Go, enjoy the world, enjoy whatever you got to do. When are you going to learn though? When are you going to learn? So the first thing we learn from Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, Torah, is going to save you from Gainom in this world. Because without it, you're leaving your children in the Satan's hands. They have no hope. You have teachers teaching them that they could be a different gender and even a different species. In fact, if I decide right now, if I decide right now, that from now on, you guys are going to call me Pablo Escobar. And I'm really a Chinese person from the middle of China. There's nothing you guys can do. That's who I'm going to be from now on. Why? Because society says that you can simply decide. And no one can decide for you who you are. But what about my birth certificate? What about my passport? What about, uh, I don't know, common sense? No, no, no. That doesn't matter anymore. This is what they teach in school. You can be whatever you want to be. This type of education is education from a Satan, to make people so stupid that they do not even know how to come back home. Unfortunately, that type of stupidity is infiltrating the Jewish community also. 
as places like Yeshiva University are now starting to become more tolerant of some of this stuff. And some communities in the UK and in New York and in Florida and other places are becoming more tolerant of this. It's not as bad as it is for the world of the Goyim, but just give it some time. Anyone who does not have Torah as the number one priority in their life and in their household, it's only a matter of time before one of their kids shows up and says, from now on, I'm an alien. Don't tell them different. Next, Rabbi Yochanan says in the name of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, says, Mutar l'idgarot b'reshaim ba'olam hazeh, sh'neemar, Ozvet Torah ve'alalu, Rasha ve'shomret Torah yidgaru bom. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai teaches, it's permissible to contend with the wicked, to fight against the wicked people in this world. As it says, in also in uh, Tehilim, the Vida Melech teaches us, I'm sorry, in uh, Proverbs, Proverbs, that those who forsake the Torah praise the wicked, and those who adhere to the Torah contend with them. Meaning, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says, you may like the Torah, you may like to watch Shure Torah, you may like sometimes when we talk against wicked people, but if you don't learn Torah yourself and make it a priority in your life, guess what? All you're doing is you're giving power to the Rashaim. You're giving power to the Rashaim. Why? Because those that are able to learn and don't learn, they're forsaking the Torah. And therefore, it's only a matter of time before they start agreeing and even praising the wicked. And those that follow the Torah, not only do they have the ability to understand what the fight is all about, but they even have the ability to fight against the wicked themselves. Why does Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai want to fight? The Torah itself is called Sefer Milchamot. The Torah says it's also called the Book of Wars. What wars? Wars for the sake of Hashem. Where Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai was somebody you simply couldn't mess with. The Chachamim themselves were scared of him. There was one time that they had to go to the Roman Caesar and convince him to cancel a decree. And they said, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, he's a melumad benisim, he's an expert in miracles. He goes, yeah, but he can't go by himself. He has to go with somebody. Nobody else wants to go. All of a sudden, the son of Rabbi Yose says, I'll go. Ooh, why'd you say that? Why'd you say that? Now he can't say he can't go. What was the problem? Uh, why can't go? Because Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is going. What do you mean why it's not going? Why didn't you think anybody else raise his hand? Why? Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is Sadiq. Because that's the problem. He's fire. If you even say one wrong thing, you're going to die on the spot. Some Mepharshim say the kid never came back. At some point he said something simple. Turn into a heap of bones, bundle of bones. Some say, no, no, he came back, it's just that it was a little tense. After Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai came out of the cave, one day, he sees this wicked convert that got him into trouble. The Gemara says in Masechet Shabbat, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai looks at him, he goes, Ah, oh, you're still alive? On the spot, he turned into bones. He didn't take a knife, chop him up, make nothing. Just looked at him. Wow, you're still alive? That's a surprise. Died on the spot, turned into bones. Fire from heaven, burned him to nothing. In the song Bar Yochai, Zat Hashem, we're going to translate the book that Rabbi Fahim wrote a couple of years ago about commentary on that song. It's a song that was written by Mekubal, one of the biggest Mekubalim. 
has a lot of secrets in it. One of the one of the verses in there says how Bar Yochai went to war with wicked people. Even though a lot of wicked people celebrate Bar Yochai, Bar Yochai, Bar Yochai, they don't realize if Bar Yochai was here right now with them, he'd burn all of them because of anybody going against Hashem. Now he loved Am Yisrael and he did whatever he could to get Am Yisrael to sanctify themselves. But people that simply chose to ignore that and just go against Hashem, his neshama couldn't tolerate it. And because his neshama was at such a high level, his holiness was at such a high level, HaKadosh Baruch Hu simply would not allow the world to continue with this, in, with this in play. He would simply literally just make people disappear. Even the movies couldn't imagine things like this. Now, the Gemara continues and says... Rabbi Yochanan says in the name of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, Kol ha-kovea makom letfilato, anyone who assigns a set place to pray, oivav noflim, tachtav, his enemies will fall under him. Shene'emar, v'samti makom le'ami le'Yisrael. As it says, this is in a, um, the book of Shmuel, I shall yet appoint a place for my people for Israel. So Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says, "You have another teaching here." It says, "Okay, you should have your place in your Bet Knesset where you pray every day." Why? If you have a set place that you pray every day, it gives you certain protection—not just protection where your prayers are protected. Your requests are protected. But even your enemies that are praying against you, praying to defeat you, Hashem will make sure that they are defeated. But sometimes people take this to an extreme. And when they go to shul and they see somebody sitting in their chair, they lose their mind. Huh? What do you do in my chair? Don't you know I'm here already for 10 years? Don't you know I'm already here for 50 years? Don't you know I was already born with this chair? How could you see my chair? What are you doing in my chair? Go find a different chair. And they make a big thing, forgetting about the fact that they're murdering this guy in public. Okay, you want to show somebody sitting in the chair that you always sit in? No problem. Go sit in the different chair. Why? You're not allowed to murder people in public. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai told you, yes, pray in the same place, but not if it's at a cost of other people's lives where you're embarrassing people on a, on a daily basis every time somebody sits in your chair. Rabbi Yochanan teaches further in the name of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Attending to those who study Torah is greater than studying Torah unto them. As it says... He also brings a uh, verse from the book of Kings, chapter 3, verse 11. Kings uh, 2. He says, Elisha ben Shephat, ma'im Eliyahu. Says here, Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who poured water on the hands of Eliyahu, Eliyahu Navi. This is describing the connection between Elisha Navi and his teacher, Eliyahu Navi. And it doesn't say that Elisha Navi was the Talmud of Eliyahu Navi, or that he studied under him, but rather it says that this is Elisha who washed the hands of Eliyahu Navi. Meaning that the Gdula of Elisha Navi that resurrected the dead, even after he died, there was a war one time, and one of the uh, people that died in war. They wanted to get rid of the body. They threw him in some hole. They didn't know that Elisha Navi was buried there. As soon as his body touched where Elisha Navi was, he came back to life. Meaning Elisha Navi's Kedusha was so extraordinary. This is in the Tanakh. This is not even a, a Midrash. This is a Tanakh. It's a literal story in the Tanakh. The Kedusha of Elisha Navi was so extraordinary 
that even after he died, he was able to resurrect the dead. But yet he's not known as Elisha, a Navi, a Kadosh, a this. He was the studied under Eliyahu. No, no, no. It's Elisha who washed the hands of Eliyahu and Navi. Why? Says Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Why do you think Elisha and Navi became Elisha and Navi? It wasn't because he was a good student or because he had a good memory or because he gave a lot of staka. No, no, no. It's because he was willing to sacrifice his life for his rabbi. He was willing to serve his rabbi. He was willing to do anything for his rabbi, even something that you would look at as small as washing his hands. Just like the Khatam Sofer washed Rabbi Natan Adler's hands with the snow, with freezing his own hands until he could fill an entire bowl of water. Do you know how much snow you have to literally melt in order to fill up one of these Netilat Yadayim cups? I don't know if anybody today could possibly do it physically without simply just getting a frostbite. But here you see, that question is not even in their mind. Why? What do you mean? My rabbi needs water. What's the question? Yeah, but the risk, it's cold, maybe he can wait. It's not even a question. Says the Rebbe Mitzans, that's why the Khatam Sofer became the Khatam Sofer. Says Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, that's why Elisha Navi became Elisha Navi. That's why Elisha Navi became Elisha Navi. In fact, it also says this about Yeshua Ben Nun. Yeshua Ben Nun, he was second in command after Moshe Rabbeinu. But the Ralbag and the Gaon Vilna comment, and they say that. Yeshua ben Nun is not known as the successor behind Moshe Rabbeinu. It's not known as the student of Moshe Rabbeinu, even though he was next to him like a shadow, waiting for him at the bottom, bottom of the mountain, 40 days, 40 nights. Hashem brought the man to Yeshua ben Nun at the mountain, at the bottom of the mountain. But he's not known as Moshe Rabbeinu's student. He's not known as Moshe Rabbeinu's successor. What is he known? He was his attendant. He was helper. Assistant. Today, people are so focused on titles that sometimes a person is not even willing to accept a job. Even if the salary is exactly what he wants or more. Even if the office is exactly what he wants and more. But if they don't give him the title that he wants, I'm not accepting this offer. It's unacceptable that you guys would only call me vice president. It's unacceptable that I am just a manager. I'm, I have to be more. I have to be executive vice president. I have to be the executive of the executive of the executive branch's vice president to the point where they already think that I'm the president. You realize it's just words on a business card, right? No, no, no. It's much more than that. People, they won't do business with me if I'm just a vice president. They won't do business. They won't buy anything from me if I'm just a manager. I have to be the CEO. Yeah, but you just came here. How you going to People are delirious. With titles. The guy thinks that he is much more than what he is. Not realizing that the greatest people that ever lived became what they were. Became what they are because they knew where they stood next to their master. Says Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, this is what we learn about Shimush. Now, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai literally has endless memrut, endless teachings in the Gemara in many, many different places. But we're not going to have a very long shoe. I'm going to have to give you a couple of more points and send you guys on your way. But I want to make sure that the, we give the honor to Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, at least that we can, to understand what type of Kedusha was in this world, is still in this world for anybody that's willing to learn. In the... Sefer Doresh Tov by Rabbi Ephraim, our own very dear Rabbi Ephraim Kachlon. 
He writes all types of books. He wrote a book against the missionaries. He wrote a book to expose the different heretical things that are inside Christianity. He wrote a book for people that want to give shurim. He wrote a response that was admired and praised by Gdolei Adol. He wrote books for young people, older people, Baruch Hashem, all types of books. But you're never going to see Rav Ephraim call himself what people call themselves, Mekubal, Kadosh, all this nonsense that people think. In fact, some people they say, oh yeah, he's the biggest rabbi in the world. Why? Look how many subscribers he has. To be a big rabbi today, you need subscribers. Apparently, if you have a lot of subscribers, or if you have a lot of people come to you, you're a big rabbi. You ask, well, what, what is your rabbi, what does he learn? Oh no, he knows the whole Torah. Okay, great, he knows the whole Torah. But what does he learn every day? Does he learn a lot? Does he write books? No, you know, once in a while he writes, uh, you know, one of those, uh, you know, like family-friendly books that takes about 15 minutes to, uh, to write. Or if you use ChatGTP, it makes you 30 seconds. What does he learn? What do you learn? Okay, you know what? Let's forget about your rabbi. What do you learn? You're the student. You're the byproduct. What do you learn? Oh yeah, I watch Shua once or twice a week. Okay, great. The, the Shua is great. Fantastic. What else? What do you learn though? No, that's what I learn. What do you mean? Where's the Gemara? Where's the Shuchan Aruch? Where's the Chumash? What about... No, no, that, that stuff, uh, you know. I didn't get there yet. Wait, so he's your rabbi for 5, 10, 15 years and you're still stuck on one or two Shurim a week? And you think that this is a good byproduct? Rabbi Ephraim, the learning that I saw, I've been learning with them already for over a decade. But the learning that you see face to face is very different because you see the whole day. And one of the most amazing things that I saw face to face each time is that he kept getting greater and bigger and do things that are unimaginable. When I tell people, yeah, listen, my rabbi, he finished the Shaz four times before he was 20. Like, nah, come on, really? How do you know? The truth is, how do you know? Well, there's a couple ways. One, every time he finishes the Shaz, he has a big party. So whoever attended all the parties knows. Number two, if you look at the average person today, you tell him, listen, do daf yomi. It's very good. Every seven years, you'll finish the Shaz. Some people jump into that. Baruch Hashem. It's good. Every seven years you have a bunch of people finishing the Shaz. Fantastic thing. They tell him, listen, Rav Kanievsky, he completed the Shaz Bavli, the Shaz Yerushalmi, every year, and many, many others for him. How? Seven dapim per day. Like, oh no, that's impossible. Why do you say it's impossible? Why? Because you never did it, it's impossible? So why? Because as long as only the biggest rabbi in the world did it, that means that you have no obligation on yourself? So each time a person hears about these big things that the big rabbis did, automatically they say, oh no, it's impossible. They're they're the biggest rabbis in the world. You don't need to be the biggest rabbis in the world in order to do big things. You simply need to want it. The last time we went to Eretz Yisrael, we signed up almost 70 or 80 people to complete the Shas in one year. That means seven pages per day. Seven dapim per day. Baruch Hashem, out of the 80 or so that signed up, we still have about 60-something left that are in it, and Bezat Hashem are scheduled to finish. None of them have ever completed the Shas in one year. We have other students that completed the Shas in one year in previous years, much less, but not, this was the biggest sign-up. Now this year, I don't find Baruch Hashem, he finished the Shas many times, but he says, listen, I can't just tell people to finish the Shas in one year, and I don't do it. Not that he hasn't done it, but I have to do it also. The problem is, he tells me, I don't have time. I don't have time. Between this learning that I have to do on Sunday, where I have the learning with you, and I have the learning on my own, and I have to do the shoe, and I have to do the other shoe, I don't have time. He says, ah, I got it. What I'll do, instead of learning the seven pages per day, 
I don't have time for seven pages per day. So what I'll do is I'll just learn 50 pages every Friday afternoon. And that's what he does. Every Friday afternoon, when some of us are still sleeping, by then he's already halfway there to completing 50 Dapim in the Gemara. This is not because of, oh, he has supernatural powers. It's because somebody dedicated themselves day and night and is willing to die for it. And after a period of time, HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives a person more and more powers than they know what to do with. So when I see people and I tell them, listen, what are you learning? I don't know. It doesn't do anything for me what you're learning. I'm just trying to see how healthy or sick you are. When somebody tells me, listen, I'm really having a tough time learning. What, so you only learning two hours a day, three hours a day? No, no, more like, uh, you know, like a half hour a week. How are you not in the ICU unit? So when I see that my Rav can complete 50 Dapim on a Friday afternoon and I witnessed it with my own eyes. 50 Dapim in one, literally in an afternoon. It's the whole afternoon, but it's the afternoon nonetheless. I say to myself, when are you going to give me the ability to even do some part of that? And if we don't cry for ourselves, then who's going to cry for us? So when we say, yeah, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai was great, he was amazing, and Rabbi Vadya was great, he was amazing, and this one was great, was amazing, and this rabbi, no, oh, great, what about you? All of them are great, good. What does that do for you? How are you going to acquire the spark from them in order to make you great? Yeah, but I work. What, you think they didn't work? If you see their schedule, it makes your schedule look like you're a, ch- a kindergarten child. If you see how busy they are and how much they achieve and how much they work and how hard they... It makes you look like you're on vacation. So Rabbi Ephraim writes that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says in the Gemara Masechet Nida. Daf Yud Zayin Amud Aleph 17a that there are certain things that a person does that puts his life at risk. Certainly, ignoring the Torah, mistreating the Torah, mistreating Chachamim, all that stuff is an obvious. But he says even certain things that a person would never even pay attention to, such as eating a uh, onion or a um, garlic that was already cut open and left overnight. You took an onion, you cut it in half, you left it in the fridge by itself, Rabbi Shalom Yochai says, don't eat it. Why? It's not good for your neshama. He says, water, or any type of uh, liquid that was left open. Overnight, you see your favorite drink waiting for you on the counter, waiting for you in the fridge. But you left it open. Average person says, ah, no, what's the big deal? Unless it's Coca-Cola or something and you still like the uh, little bubbles. You don't have any bubbles anymore. People complain, oh, it's flat. I never understood what that meant when I came here to America. What does it mean? It's flat. I didn't understand what it was. Until it says, oh, I drank it. It's like, why are you drinking? It's flat. I'm like, no, it tastes fine. No, it's flat. I'm like, no, no, it tastes fine. I don't understand what they're talking about. It's like, no, the gas is. I'm like, who cares? It's the same taste. Gas, no gas. Well, I have to jump with the gas. People, you know, people are a little fanatic with the taste buds. Rabbi Shalom Ba Yochai says, it's not taste buds. You left some drink open overnight, don't drink it. Now some people are saying, ah, it's too much, no, come on. What, it's based on if a snake is going to, you know, put some venom in it. Where are you going to see some snakes? Where are you going to see snakes? The snakes anywhere? By the way, there was a snake here. There was a snake here. But don't worry. Sonny saw it. 
He was here for a weekend one time. We're here sitting on Shabbat, and all of a sudden we see this anaconda. Or, I mean, really wasn't that big, but it was, it was this giant snake. In my eyes, it was like giant. It was like this anaconda from a movie. Go across my backyard. Now, one day, if that wasn't entertaining enough, we go outside to take uh, to take the uh, I don't know, my kids out. Oh, I went to the next to the garbage. I don't know, whatever I was. All of a sudden, you know, my kids are playing outside. All of a sudden, I see my kid, my daughter, run from the run like she just saw like I don't know some malach or something, and she's screaming snake, snake, snake. Poor kid was traumatized. I'm looking for this thing everywhere. Not that I know what to do with it. But I'm looking, where's the, where, I call the guy, he says, by the time he goes, yeah, it's gone. It's gone, of course, you're not going to see it. So anyway, Akadosh Baruch who heard my prayers one day, most likely heard my wife's prayers. So one day, you know, I, uh, we, we went out somewhere, we took the kids out, they did a little siyum or something, so we, anytime my kids finish a book, we usually do something for them, we take them for ice cream, or go buy them some toys. To celebrate the Torah. It's very important for a household. One of the things I learned from Rabbi Ephraim, every time you or the kids complete a book of substance, not like a, you know, a uh, three-page book, you know, a book of substance, we call it a masechet, where they complete an entire series of books or a big book, buy them a present, have a party, do something. Why? To celebrate the Torah. Whether it's you or them. Why? So everybody's excited about Torah. So one day we took them out, and uh, it was at night. Like a Motzei Shabbat or something like that. I went to, I think, uh, I don't know, one of these, uh, uh, Dwayne Reed, uh, other way, uh, Walgreens or something to go buy them some toys. When we come back, I see there's something weird on the on the street, but it's night. You can barely see anything. There's, you know, they're too cheap over here to, to, to buy any uh, real lights. And, uh, anyway, I, um, I go back inside. The next morning, I need to go somewhere. And I see there's something on the same exact thing on the streets. I get closer to it. I'm like, What is it? The snake. He's still on the street. I ran him over the night before. Or somebody ran him over. But he's right near my, uh, my, uh, you know, my, my driveway. So says Rabbi Shimon Ba Yochai that there are certain things that a person should not do because they sacrifice, they're putting their life in danger. One of them is to not drink something that was left open. Some people think this is extreme. Why? Because the Gemara says, because maybe a snake is going to, you know, drink from that uh, water or that milk or something, and then, uh, you know, he can poison it. So people today are like, ah, come on, no snakes. There's no snakes. I live on the 39th floor in New York. No snakes here. Rav Kanievsky, Allah Shalom, was even more stringent about this. He says... If you walk away from anything, any water, any liquid, walk away from it. Not during night. At any time you walk away from it, it's away from your eyes, now to drink it. In his house, now to drink it. One time, it was very, very difficult economy over there. It was very difficult to have get milk, but the Rabbanit got some milk. She was cooking the milk. Boiling the milk. Somebody rang the door. She went to the door, and she came back to the uh, thing, and she goes, Oh, the rabbi said, her husband, Said that you can't walk away from it. But what am I going to spill this whole milk? It's impossible to get. It's so expensive. But the rabbi said, What do I do? What do I do? I have to listen to the rabbi. She takes the pot full of milk. She pours it into the sink. And a snake comes out of the milk. Out of the pot. A little snake went inside the pot. Snuck through the window. Went into the pot, apparently drowned him, drowned in literally in a matter of moments. Drowned inside. Why did Akadosh Bahu do this? To show you, Chachamim don't say something for no reason. Rabbi Shimon Bayochai says, be careful with the things, including eggs. Eggs also, you cut eggs open, leave them overnight, don't eat them. Why do he care about all this? When he's telling about things, about angels, and he's learning, and all supernatural stuff, now he's telling about little food? Yeah, because if you don't care about the small things, you're not going to care about the big things. If you don't care about the small things, you think it's a big deal. You don't believe that leaving an onion cut overnight and then eating it, is, is, is that, if you don't believe that's dangerous for you, 
spiritually, then everything else that Rabbi Shimon Bar can teach you is not relevant to you. Why? If you don't believe the small stuff, why are you going to believe the big stuff? And why do you even think it's small stuff? And that's the difference. Where Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says that as the Gemara in Masechet Chagiga, at the end of the Masechet, that Talmidei Chachamim kol gufam esh. It's one of the things that Rabbi Ephraim brings in his Doresh Tov, page 65 on uh, Lag Baomer. Talmidei Chachamim, they're all fire. They're all fire. And when a person thinks about Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, you can understand why fire. But to finalize it all, we're going to bring something from the Zohar that could show you how a person could be, theoretically speaking, a Shomer Mitzvot person, keeps Torah, keeps Mitzvot, but he lights fire on Shabbat. Without even realizing it. The Zohar Kadosh in Parashat Tazriya talks about how dangerous anger is. And it says that anger, when somebody gets angry on Shabbat, it's like they are lighting the fire of Genom. You get angry on Shabbat, the food is not hot enough, somebody's late to eat, somebody's not paying attention to your Dvar Torah, you express anger, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says in the Zohar Kadosh, you just lit fire on Shabbat. And even further, if that's not enough, he says, at that moment, whatever you were doing in that time, whatever you were holding, whatever you were reading, becomes property of the Satan. And no blessing can come upon that thing. And there's an angel that, the, that comes... An angel of the Satan comes and says out loud that perhaps you can't hear it, but a Kadosh Baruch can hear it and all the angels can hear it. This is the sacrifice that this so-and-so person offered to our side of the Satan. What you just, you were eating, what you were drinking, what you were reading, whatever you were doing while you were getting angry, just became a Koban for the Satan. And an angel announces this. This just became the sacrifice of the Koban. What's putting it on fire? The anger. And then another, then another voice comes out, says Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Woe to the person who strayed and followed a false god in his rage. He has worshipped a foreign god. And then a second voice comes out. The voice of HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, Woe to them, they have strayed from me. Why? You lost your temper on Shabbat. If you believe the Torah of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is holy, then the big and the small are the same. But if you think that only the big stuff that makes things fly in the air is good, then this stuff is not relevant to you. Why is it? Ah, come on. No, he's, he's extreme. He's fanatic. Everybody gets angry. Everybody gets angry. No, come on. Why? It really becomes a sacrifice for the Satan? Okay, so you're a heretic in Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's Torah. And that's the difference. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai was willing to sacrifice everything and anything that he had for the sake of even the smallest thing. Whether it's to serve as rabbi or its service creator. To him, there was no difference. Whether it was to learn the basics of alachot, or learn the secrets about fruits and vegetables that you leave overnight, or the secrets of what are these voices that I'm now finally hearing of these angels when somebody got angry. Oh, oh that's this guy. Oh, he's the, he just made a sacrifice to this and that. He just made, oh, that's what's happening. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai was looked at every aspect of the Torah and said, this is a big deal. Yiratzon that we too will take the Torah 
and make each and every part of it a big deal. Every single part of it, part of our life, every single part of it, part of our purpose. And make sure that our houses, our families, our friends, our communities, and even our enemies, at least have an opportunity to learn this Torah, to live this Torah, and to at the very least see how important we think it is. Perhaps that's going to be enough of an influence to make them want to be one of the Talmudim of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Thank you very much for learning with me, Hashem. Bless each and every single one of you. The schut of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, Bezat Hashem, will go for all of your merits, for all of your lives, to give you Panasatova, Priyut, Atzlacha, all of the blessings of the Torah, Bezat Hashem, to each and every single one of you. Thank you. This is Kuli Mitzvot.